I think the report has been significant partly because of its timing. It came out when we were experiencing higher food prices than we've experienced for 40 years and greatly increased food price volatility. This has really raised the significance of food within the policy world. And people are wondering about the confluence of what John Beddington, the chief scientist, calls a perfect storm. We're going to see greatly increased demand, more people, richer people demanding a varied, more varied food uh, a collection of foods, many of which have a greater impact on the environment. We're going to see increasing pressures on the supply side, various uh, supply side shocks, for example, from increased frequency of drought, increased fr frequency of floods, etc. And um, all this we're going to see as climate change becomes increasingly important. Well, in, in DEFRA, we, it has really become the, the lodestar but which guides all our work. We've used it to support uh, our climate risk assessment, our ecosystems analysis, it obviously underlay last year's uh, in National Environment White Paper, and perhaps most of all, the what we call the Green Food Project, which is trying to work out how we produce more and impact on the environment less, bringing together all different aspects of concern about producing food and doing so sustainably. Well, in our department, in the Department for International Development, uh, throughout our country offices in all the countries of operation, and indeed in our general research, which is being applied across everything we do, this is now a, a seam which is essential to the way we think about uh, everything. And above all, it's to make sure it isn't a report that just sits on a shelf, however good it is, but it is implementable. And it's looking at the key issues of behaviour change. How do you incentivise human beings to do their best and right things, both for the, themselves and their interaction with the planet, and the intensification of, of food, both in terms of its productivity, its production, uh, and making these things uh, simple enough in terms of the science so that everybody understands it and realises why this imperative needs to be followed. Well, from my point of view, this report was extremely important because it provided a well-timed and comprehensive benchmark of the pressures which global agriculture is facing today and the pressures it will face in the future. And it's also very well timed because of the ongoing debate about the European Common Agricultural Policy and also the uh, Horizon 2020 research programme. Ah, well, from my point of view, the importance of the report with the British Chamber of Commerce is that it gave us the chance with the Food Security, Safety and Sustainability Task Force, gave us the chance to bring the international business community together with policy makers, with representatives of the, of the entire food chain um, to discuss the magnitude of the issues facing the global food and farming system. The Foresight Report gives us that opportunity to open that debate up and talk freely amongst ourselves about what future we want together. Is it one of shared prosperity? where we will seek to share those resources so that everybody has enough food to eat and everybody can go to bed with knowing that they have food security for tomorrow or one of dog-eat-dog -dog where some people will get enough and others will not. Well, with a billion people going to bed hungry, there's a heck of a lot more to do. Those people are going to bed hungry not because there's not enough food in the world, but because they don't have the income to be able to buy that food. It's an obscenity that we live in such a world, so there's a huge amount to do. But we have the opportunity to put those things right. I think that the international community does recognise, in a way that probably five years ago it didn't, the importance of food security to the world. Uh, I think also that we need to be thinking about putting food security in the context of climate change as well. Climate change is happening. Um, it will continue to happen and if we are to feed the increasing number of people on earth then we need to be thinking about an agriculture that develops in a way that it doesn't significantly increase greenhouse gas production as it increases. In the future, farmers will look dramatically different from the overall wearing, tractor driving workers of today. They'll be scientists and highly skilled individuals who will don lab coats and roam aisles of scaffolding stacked high with leafy greens that won't rely on sunlight, soil, or even pesticides. 
Today, these vertical farms are already starting to transform agriculture through a combination of biotechnology, engineering, and data science. By carefully controlling the environment, these futuristic farms have the ability to extend the growing season, meaning they're able to provide food all year round for the world's ever-expanding population. Through stacking plants vertically, they can be grown using much less space compared to traditional farming methods, where crops sprawl across vast expanses of farmland. And by placing these farms closer to urban areas, farmers can guarantee the freshness of their crops to the city-dwelling consumers because time won't be lost to transport before the plants make it to their shelves. Plus, less transport means less greenhouse gas emissions and a smaller carbon footprint, which is better for everyone. There are different types of vertical farms ranging from small-scale, with specialized, higher-value plants, all the way up to large-scale agriculture, the type meant to compete with mass farming operations. Farm One is a small-scale vertical farm based in New York City and located beneath a Michelin star restaurant. It grows over 500 different microgreens and rare herbs year-round, and it is the only company focused on supplying these sought-after premium ingredients directly to nearby prominent chefs within hours of harvesting. Each plant is grown hydroponically without the use of pesticides or manure with the most cutting-edge LED technology which allows for maximum efficiency. Plants grown this way use a nutrient-rich solution as their growing substrate, requiring approximately 90% less water than conventional farming, which, aside from being better for the environment, also allows farmers to cut costs on unneeded water expenses. Farm One believes their smaller farms, located close to customers, can provide most, if not all, of the specialty produce needed for tomorrow's cities. While Farm One is still quite new, Aero Farms has been around since 2004 with the same goal of totally controlled agriculture. Originally located in an old warehouse in Newark, New Jersey, Aero Farms has expanded into nine large-scale facilities worldwide, selling their produce through the retail brand Dream Greens. They manage their greens from seed to package and produce 390 times more crop per square foot than the traditional farming field because they can grow each plant in half the time. While both AeroFarm and Farm One grow crops vertically, AeroFarms use aeroponics as opposed to hydroponics used by Farm One. That means AeroFarms miss their mixture of nutrients, water, and oxygen onto their crop's roots, resulting in close to 95% less water usage over traditional farms. And that's not the only innovation. They use their own proprietary patented reusable cloth for seeding, germinating, growing, and harvesting. The cloth is made of BPA-free, post-consumer recycled plastic, and each one takes 350 water bottles out of the waste stream. And after each use, the cloth can be harvested, fully sanitized, and reseeded with no risk of contamination. Regardless of which form of vertical farming you consider, you'll find they all share a desire to be more sustainable, innovative, and future-proof than conventional farming. And the most surefire way to do this is through their controlled environment, which eliminates the risk of crop loss due to natural disasters like flooding or drought. As our population keeps rising, there will be more mouths to feed, and we will need more efficient solutions, just like vertical farming. It's now more than ever that we need companies like Farm One and Aero Farms to perfect the technology that could potentially feed the world both sustainably and safely in the future. Our buildings consume about 40% of our energy. And with our emissions threatening to permanently change our climate, we need more efficient, better, greener cities. We can start by being smarter with what we have. Passive solar buildings, public transit, private pedal power, high density living and teleworking. But our food production is still a long way from most of the people who live in the cities 
built on the best arable land. Vertical farming could turn this on its head, or at least its side. It would bring together a host of emerging technologies by putting food production on the buildings we live and work in to reduce land use, cool our urban heat sinks and drastically reduce food transport costs. Modern agriculture uses 70% of the world's available fresh water, but vertical farms could be fitted with nanofilms that boost condensation and nanomembranes would filter and clean recycled water. Better water quality, less waste. Crop effectiveness would be boosted by genetic engineering to select the best genetic variants for the environment. Fibre optics might provide light with incredible energy efficiency. One square block farm, 30 storeys high, could yield as much food as 10 square kilometres outdoors. There are, of course, hurdles. The crops best suited to vertical farming may require us to adjust our diets. But would farmers and agribusiness take this lying down? Or is it simply that our dollars are best spent on smart, simple and practical improvements to existing infrastructure and technology? <laughs>